So, why is any of this important for public health? Well, if we're going to protect people from getting sick through the exposure to certain chemicals, we have to know what levels or concentrations those chemicals might be present in the drinking water or in the environment before we begin to see adverse effects on human health. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. And at this point, I would be pausing for questions, but since we're not in class and you cannot raise your hand, or if you're raising your hand, I cannot see you raise your hand, let's go on to an example of a chemical that is increasingly found in groundwater, or perfluorooctanoic acid, or PFOA. Now this is a non-stick coating. It's been applied to pans and cookware and is found in other products such as fabric protectors. Why do we call it perfluorooctanoic acid? Well, in this we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbon atoms. That would be our octa. We have an as, what's called an acid group on the end of this molecule. An acid releases hydrogen ions into the water. These hydrogen ions are what reacts with uh, things. When we say we have a chemical reaction with acid, what is actually happening is we have a chemical reaction with these hydrogen atoms that are loose in the water. And fluoro because of it has fluorine atoms bound to the carbons in the 8-carbon chain. You don't really have to worry about the structure except to know acid, fluorine atoms, 8-carbon backbone, per fluorooctanoic acid. Now, since this material is appearing in the groundwater, the U.S. EPA is eager to set a exposure limit and determine the risk. So the first thing the EPA did was determine a lifetime health advisory. And for that, we begin with our drinking water exposure limit. We begin with our reference dose. And there was an animal study of female laboratory animals exposed to PFOA, and that gave the US EPA a lowest observed adverse effects level of 0 0.00002 milligrams per kilogram of body weight per day. And again, this was a lowest observed adverse effects level from an animal study. So we're going to plug that in up here. Now we are not laboratory animals. The average human is estimated to be about 70 kilograms, so that goes here. And our drinking water intake is in the denominator. Now we talked a little bit about the drinking water um, relative source contribution. This is slightly different. The concept is the same, but you'll notice that what we're doing is we're taking body weight per body weight liters, kilograms per day. It's a concept based on body weight, a concept where the water consumed is based on a person's body weight. The math is slightly different, but the concept is the same. Remember that we are dividing by the daily water intake when we're calculating a dwell, but in this case, we are factoring body weight into this daily water intake, which is in the which is in the denominator of the equation. 
Now, our health advisory is the dwell times the relative source contribution. In other words, we are assuming that of all of the ways a person might be exposed to PFOA, perhaps mostly through his or her food, only 20% is going to come from water or drinking water. Therefore, we don't want to think about that 80% that is not coming from drinking water when we're setting a drinking water exposure limit or looking at the amount of this material that could be present in groundwater before there are adverse health, health effects. So now if we take our drinking water exposure limit times the relative source contribution, we get 0 0.07 micrograms per liter. Now, a few slides back, we added an additional uncertainty factor when we were calculating our lifetime health advisory. In this particular example, the US EPA did not have that second uncertainty factor. Of course, if you wanted to, or if they wanted to, they could have incorporated that second uncertainty factor, or they felt confident in their data. Okay, now that we have got our health advisory, the limit within groundwater or drinking water before we should we expect to see adverse effects. Now, what about risk of cancer? So, typically when we determine cancer risk, we want to have no more than one case of cancer for every million persons who might be exposed to this chemical. In other words, one person is going to get cancer from this chemical out of one million people who have been exposed to this. But before we do that, let's do some alphabet soup. And the first bit of alphabet soup is the human equivalent dose or HED. Now remember here, our lowest observed adverse effects level came from female laboratory animals. Our lowest observed adverse effects level came from female laboratory animals. And for our human equivalent dose, we have to scale that up to a human being. And we now have one more factor to consider, and that is the slope factor. And you don't need me to read this for you. It is the slope factor is used to calculate cancer risk as a linear extrapolation from the 95% lower confidence limit on the dose at the lowest prescribed risk level supported by the data to the origin of the dose response curve. And if you understood that, good for you. But all you really have to know is that we are not talking about the middle of the dose response curve. Rather, the slope factor describes how we project to the bottom of the dose response curve from the measured part of the dose response curve. And as we said last week, the bottom of the dose response curve is where all the interesting things are happening in terms of public health. Okay. Now, another thing we discussed last time is that one thing we don't have when we construct the dose response curve is we simply do not extrapolate straight down to the baseline and call it safe. So here's our lowest observed adverse effects level at four dose units on the x-axis. And remember, these could be any units we want, micrograms per kilogram of body weight, or micrograms per kilo, um, liter of water, or milligrams per gram of body weight, doesn't matter. Again, the, the x-axis unit. At four, the lowest of, we get our lowest observed adverse effects level. Now, can we simply extend that straight down to the baseline? Do we know if this line down here is going to be linear? Of course we don't. We only know the lowest observed adverse effects level, and we have absolutely no idea 
what's going to happen below that level. So now let's look at a dose response curve. We have a statistical confidence limit on the dose. So essentially what we're doing is we're going down to the 10% response level. That might be our lowest observed adverse effects level, for instance, at this dose, the dose uh, 10% the lowest estimated dose at 10% of the response. The point is that the slope is, the slope factor is how we extend this line down through the unknown territory. How do we extend this line down through the unknown territory down to a dose where there is 0% response. How do we extend this line down through the unknown territory to a dose where there is a 0% response? That's all you've got to understand when it comes to slope factor. We could have a very steep slope. Oops, we have a very steep slope. We could have a very gradual slope. But how do we extend this line to the point where we have 0% response? Okay, so let's go back to our cancer risk determination. So our laboratory annual dose response curve showed a 4% increase in cancer at 1.99 milligrams per kilogram of body weight a day. So this becomes our benchmark dose and it is based on a lowest observed adverse effects level. Now, uh, this the math is actually far more complicated. Uh, I'm vastly oversimplifying it, but again, don't worry about it. What we're seeing is a 4% increase in cancer at this dose, which is a lowest observed adverse effects level and thus this forms our benchmark dose. So now we take our benchmark dose from an animal study and convert it to a human equivalent dose of 0.58 milligrams per kilogram per day. So laboratory animal dose 1.99, human equivalent dose 0.58. All right, now we take our slope factor and we assume an 80 kilogram person consumes 2.5 liters of water per day. And here is our calculation, a risk specific dose. So we have the level of cancer or the, uh, um, or we take the, what we call it, the level of cancer, that's not the right word, the, ex the number of cancer cases we, ex we anticipate, in this case, one in a million, multiply that by the human equivalent dose, right there, human equivalent dose. We take the body weight, body weight, divide by the water intake per day, 2.5 liters a day, and the slope factor, in other words, how do we extrapolate down to the 0% response through the unknown part of the dose response curve? And remember, this looks a lot like the generalized formula for a drinking water exposure limit. Reference dose, body weight, divided by daily water intake. So by adding the slope factor, and the cancer risk level into this formula, we get a risk specific dose of 0 0.0004 divided by 0 0.175 milligrams per liter or 0 0.23 micrograms per liter. So what this means, what this means is that if the 
uh, concentration of this chemical in drinking water is less than or equal to 0 0.23 micrograms per liter, we were only going to see one in one case of cancer in one million people who are exposed to this chemical. Now, in this example, we're measuring the we are using a human equivalent dose. It could be an oral reference dose. It could be an ADI. The math works the same. Remember, we had an animal study which was converted to a human dose. The slope factor, again defined by the UP US EPA, all you need to remember is that it is not referring to the middle of the dose response curve. It is the slope of the projection to the bottom of the dose response curve through the unknown part of the dose response curve below our lowest observed adverse effects level or no observed adverse effects level or in this case our uh, effects dose at 10% of the population. This is our lowest measured dose. This is a confidence statistical confidence limit on that measured dose. This is our unknown territory and the slope factor describes how we are going to extend these lines through the unknown territory. Now, so far, we have considered cancer risk from drinking water as an adult. So let's consider another calculation for a child, but using other routes of exposure. And again, to keep YouTube from kicking me off for recording overly long videos, I'm going to pause it here.